Apreciados amigos y amigas, que alegría que estemos todos juntos aquí en la Iglesia de Todos los Santos. Dear friends, what a joy it is that we are here together this morning at All Saints Church. Mi nombre es Mike Kinman. My name is Mike Kinman, so rector. I am the rector. Mi pronombre son él. My pronouns uh, are he, him. Uh, welcome wherever you are. You may be streaming us on Facebook or YouTube or on our live stream page. A couple of you are here uh, on Zoom, and I'm happy to share that we are going to be uh, back live streaming from the sanctuary today for our 1115 service uh, and for our 1 p.m. service. Uh, so glad to be back. Um, even more glad that what that means is the infection levels have gone down enough uh, that we're able to be together in this way. So please, wherever you are, please stay safe. Uh, we're asking people don't just mask, but double mask when you go out. When you go out, uh, if you are eligible, when you become eligible to get the vaccine, please get the vaccine. Uh, if you need help, uh, we can. We got folks here. Kelly Aaron O'Fallon has been wonderful. Same with Sally Howard, helping people navigate the systems to get those vaccines. Uh, keep washing your hands, staying safe, and keep reaching out and caring for and and, and loving each other. Um, so deeply grateful, deeply, deeply grateful. Um, we have uh, every. Let's see if I can talk straight. <laughs> every uh, every week since this pandemic has begun. Uh, we have had what we call a, uh, a partner in love. Uh, and that's almost always been an organization uh, that we have partnered with who's doing amazing work in the community. And uh, we want to make sure that they uh, stay functioning and stay able to provide their compassionate care work in this community. Our partner in love this week is a little different. Uh, it's a GoFundMe page for Mario Ramirez. Uh, Mario is the grandson of Victoria Joya. Victoria is a longtime All Saints child care worker. And on Valentine's Day, Mario, uh, who was 10, was, was playing out in front of his house um, and he was caught in a, in a crossfire. Uh, he sustained life-threatening injuries and is currently fighting to recover. Uh, please, please keep Mario and his family in your prayers. He is currently in stable condition. His prospects for recovery look good and he will require extensive physical therapy among other things um, information as well as a link to an article about mario shooting is going in the chat so all saints church has made a donation to this uh gofundme page uh please uh as you are able uh, click on the link that is going in the chats on uh, on facebook and youtube um, and it's gofundme.com um, it's recovery for mario uh, ramirez and if you just want to google uh, go fund me, Mario Ramirez, it will come up. I also know that uh, we've been putting stuff on our Facebook page at All Saints Church about this. Uh, so please uh, give as, uh, as much as you can. Uh, appreciate that. Um, as always, if home is not a safe place for you, uh, and we know that uh, people are, being, are trying to stay home, we're going to put in the chat uh, information about the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Uh, it is a hotline. It is a website. It is a text number that you can go to. Uh, to get the help you need. And of course, you can always call us here at All Saints Church and we will uh, connect you to the resources. Just remember that if you are in an unsafe place, you are not alone. Uh, also going in the, in the chat online is uh, information about the Trevor Project. Trevor Project is an amazing uh, resource for LGBTQ youth. And so um, if you are feeling alone or unsafe or just need someone to talk to, uh, please call the Trevor Project. Um, Let's, uh, let's pray. God dwells in you and also in you. Let us pray. God of surprises, you call us from the narrowness of our traditions to new ways of being church, from the captivities of our culture to creative witness for justice, from the smallness of our horizons to the bigness of your vision. Clear the way in us, your people, that we might call others to freedom and renewed faith. Jesus, you call us from preoccupation with our own histories and hurts to daily tasks of peacemaking, from privilege and protocol to partnership and pilgrimage, from isolation and insularity to inclusive community. Clear the way in us, your people, that we might call others to wholeness and integrity. Holy transforming spirit, you call us from fear to faithfulness, from clutter to clarity, from a desire to control to deeper trust, from the refusal to love to a readiness to risk clear the way in us, your people, that we might all know the beauty and power and danger of the gospel. Amen. Amen. 
I am thrilled to welcome to All Saints Church virtually and hopefully one day in person, uh, Reverend Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart. Uh, Gail Fisher Stewart was ordained in 2015, currently serves as the interim rector of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Washington, DC. A native Washingtonian prior to accepting the call to ordained ministry, she retired from the Metropolitan Police Department as a captain and then taught at the university level. She's president for the Washington DC chapter of the Union of Black Episcopalians, serves as the chaplain for the Tacoma Park Police Department in Maryland. She has written on race policing in the Episcopal Church. Uh, to serve and protect race, the police in the Episcopal Church in the Black Lives Matter era was published in the summer 2017 edition of the Anglican Theological Review. And most recently her book, Preaching Black Lives Matter, uh, asks and answers the question, what would the church look like if black lives mattered? not one to adopt resolutions for the new year. She did this year adopt as her mantra, we don't have to live this way. And oh, I will just say, uh, amen. And uh, I will say, I was gonna say good morning to you, Gail, but I guess it's good afternoon for you. So uh, thank good you. Good afternoon here. <laughs> thank you so much to be with us. Um, because we're uh, not on Zoom primarily, uh, if you have questions uh, for Gail, ask you to text your questions to 910-TEXT-ASC, 910-TEXT-ASC. That's 910-839-8272. That's the same uh, text number that you text prayer requests into, 910-839-8272. Also, if you're on Facebook, you can put questions in the, uh, in the chat there. And um, our, our wonderful greeters will get them to us. So Gail, again, welcome. Um, I guess where I'd love to start off is just looking at your bio. That's quite a journey that you describe, uh, going from uh, police officer to to priest and really to police abolitionist. Um, can you just lay that out? Just talk about that journey. <laughs> it was not something I planned, and, and and thank you for this opportunity. And you know, just being with you this morning, it feels a little bit warmer than it is <laughs> actually here. So I'm gonna just kind of like. Um, get those vibes, those warm vibes. Uh, when, we, when we talk about my, my, my journey, my mother says I went from the devil to the Lord. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder about that. But uh, policing was not something I had thought about. It's not something in my family. So it wasn't this glorious, oh, I always want to be a police officer or you know, my father, my grandfather, my grandmother. Uh, were police officers. I was looking for money to finish my college education. And so one day I was in my sociology class and instead of taking notes and paying attention to the professor, I was reading the want ads and the police department in Washington DC was hiring. And so I left class, just got up and left and got on the bus and went down and took the test and eventually got hired. And I had no intentions of ever staying. This was just something to get me through school. Uh, but you know how you hang around for about five years and we had 20 year retirement, 20 year retirement, regardless of your age. And so I joined at 20, which meant if I stayed 20 years, I'd be 40 and I could retire. So once I got like five years on, I said, well, you know, I can, I can do another 15 because what they do is they promise you a check every month for the rest of your life if you do the 20 years. And this June, I will be retired for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So I spent 20 and I've been retired for 30. Mm -hmm. I think I have gotten my money's worth <laughs> and probably somebody else's money. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, so it wasn't, you know, it was, it was just, I, I needed a job. And the thing about it is that when I did join, my, my family and my friends were quite upset. Uh, and I was asked, you know, so now you're going to be the pig. Because this was mm. four years after um, the civil rights uh, <laughs> explosions and, mm -hmm. and everything. And of course, H Street here was in D.C. was just totally destroyed after the uprisings uh, and the aftermath of Dr. King being killed. And um, we lived in Prince George's County and they had a very bad reputation for with Africans, uh, Americans and DC wasn't much better. So my friends and my, and my parents thought I was absolutely crazy 
that I would go and be something that where the, the, the relationship between the police and me was negative in the first place. And so why are you doing this? And I got quite a, an education. Uh, I was telling someone that uh, I was in my probationary year and in your probationary year, you can be fired for anything. Just you come back in to the station and can say, okay, you're fired. And I was riding with my senior officer who happened to be white and we were in Georgetown and anybody who knows anything about DC know that Georgetown then and now is predominantly white. And so yeah. we're riding around and it's, he's driving and I'm not paying much attention. And this was during the days when you didn't have to have a reason, a valid reason for stopping folks. So we stopped folks because we were basically bored. And so he did his first four hours and it got to be my turn. And so I'm looking for a car to drive, I'm, you know, to stop. And I stopped this red car. And he said, why are you stopping that car? And I go like, because that's what we do. And he looked at me, he says, we don't stop white people. Mm. That's what I said. Mm. <laughs> because I said, do you see who's sitting next to you? Right. And he says, yeah, but we don't stop white people. So that was kind of like my first firsthand personal knowledge of what was going on but the rest of the four hours that's all I stopped were white people right and he was totally upset and I said okay this is going to be my last tour of duty <laughs> mm -hmm. I can just forget it um but he didn't say anything to to the sergeant and I did manage to make it past my probationary year, probationary year. Wow. yeah but the introduction like really <laughs> and having no compunction like nothing that we just don't do that yeah. yeah, yeah, but it got because he, he knew he wouldn't he wouldn't get any blowback from saying that. No. Mm. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Keep going. I didn't. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep going, please. No. So, um, you know, e eventually I, I began working in uh, equal opportunity office, and mm. where folks come and make complaints where mm. employees come and make complaints. So not only were there complaints from outside of the police department, there were complaints inside the police department. Mm. And you saw how racism worked. Uh, this was during a time that to get promoted, you have to have a passing uh, grade on the written exam. And you also had to have what was called a suitability score. And the mm. highest you could get was 100 on both of them. And I watched how white supervisors, because they're saying, okay, we need, we, know, we need this to be fair. We need blacks to be, to, you know, to take the exam. But I noticed that blacks weren't getting promoted. And so I'm kind of figuring out what, what is going on. Well, what would happen is that the supervisors would find blacks who were not studying and say, well, we need you to take the exam. And they gave them the 100s on the suitability score. Mm. The blacks, who were studying, they would get the low scores. And so when you average out the two, mm -hmm. um, the ones who got the high scores did not score high enough to get promoted. Mm -hmm. And so what we have, you have black officers who were studying in basements, studying at midnight, they would not tell anybody they were studying. And so to have this information to say, okay, we got to deal with stuff out in the community uh, because it was a time uh, when uh, black officers could actually go on calls for service to uh, homes of, of white homeowners. And I remember uh, a, a woman asking me if I could go to the back door. And I said, obviously, you don't want police service today. Right, so I right. got back in my car and said, uh, nothing found. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these types of things, you know, I, mm -hmm. I was growing up with because you're, you know, mm -hmm. you're talking almost 50 years ago, but still yep. watching what is going on today. That type of relationship, that negative relationship between uh, the police and persons of, of color still exists. Mm -hmm. Still exists. Yeah. And then we saw, of course, as we talk about today, reforming the police. What are we going to do with the police? We've mm -hmm. been reforming for 50 years or more. Mm -hmm. It does not work because policing in America works exactly as it was intended to work. Talk a little about that, about the history and what, and, and unpack that statement a little more. 
policing, American policing, a little bit different than law enforcement because they're all avenues or aspects of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But policing in America was created to control and contain black folks. Mm -hmm. Came out of the slave patrols, morphed into, when you look into the north of, of, of this country, uh, when immigrants of Eastern European descent decided to emigrate, the police denied them their rights the police were involved in breaking strikes of workers who were saying, we are working under unfair and inhuman uh, work conditions. But the police were on the side of the industrialists. And so the police do exactly as they were created to do, which is to keep white space white. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at all of this reform, because I came up during the time, okay, well, because the uh, relationship between blacks and the police are, are, are bad, we're gonna hire more black police officers. Mm -hmm. Oh, the relationship between the Latinos and the police, we're gonna hire more Latino officers. Oh, the relationship between the police and LGBT, you know, we're gonna have more gay officers. And, mm -hmm. but it doesn't work because you get into the system and you come in with high ideals you, you and most police officers, most police officers, and this is the part that does not come out. Most police officers join policing because they want to make a change. Hmm. But that culture is so infectious that unless you are constantly aware of how you can be changed, you will find yourselves adopting the attitudes and behaviors of whiteness of this country and discriminating and ne negatively affecting the people who look exactly like you. Mm. And so when you talk about reform, we have gone through reform after reform after reform after reform. And so now it's time and people get upset because they think, oh, we'll just have criminals running all over the place, right? I am for the abolition of policing. Mm -hmm. So that talk about we, what that means. We need yeah. to stop it. We need to stop it as it impacts our communities today. We need to put a halt to it, put a pin in it, and recreate policing the way we want it to be. You know, it's it's like if you want to make a right turn, you're driving, right? You want to make mm -hmm. a right turn, you're gonna to have to at least slow down to make that right turn. Sometimes yeah. you actually have to stop because yeah. if you keep going in the same direction, you're not gonna be able to turn right. And so we have tried to keep going in the same direction in policing and policing and go, trying to go right and left, and it's not working. And I, I, I tell people, and when I when I speak to police officers, and and this is sometimes difficult for folks to grasp is that police officers are as much victims uh, of policing as those who lie dead in our streets. Mm -hmm. Now, are there some racist police officers? Of course. Why? Because we hire, we recruit from a racist society, just like they're racist in our churches, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, right? We have to admit yep. that. There oh, are yeah. some racists. Right. Yep. There are sexes. Now we after January 6th now. Oh, you mean we actually have proud boys and extremists <laughs> on the police department? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, and, and the question is, how do we ferret them out? I said, take a walk in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Take a walk in the, look at the type of tag holders they have. Yeah. Look for the stickers. You don't have to you know, hire a consulting agency, just <laughs> take a walk in the parking lot. That's right. Look at the t-shirts that they mm -hmm. wear coming to work. These folks have been hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, oh, we've got to do this. And so we do have that cadre that we need to weed out. But the majority of police officers want to do good, but they, they, they are infected by this thing that we call American policing. Mm -hmm. And so once once you once you say that in the presence of both, you know, the community and police, say, oh, well, that makes a little bit because, you know, I really like Officer Jones, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes Officer Jones can act a little crazy. Well, that's that is the system 
uh, infecting Officer Jones. And so we have to have these conversations about how we are going to create a policing that actually does what we need to do. And of course, there are also people who talk about defunding the police. Okay. And we can actually defund the police, but you just don't take $15 million from the agency and then we got to figure out where it's going without taking the requisite number of tasks you asked the police to do that they shouldn't mm -hmm. have been doing in the first place. That's right. I mean, let's look at that mental illness. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> a 16 hour course on mental illness does not make mm -hmm. you an expert. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Right? Yeah. And so if we are going to defund the police, we have to say, what are the tasks that the police should not have been doing in the first place? Sure. But because they are 24 7, mm -hmm. and we have taught the community if anything happens, call 911. That's right. We have to take those tasks away from the police, make sure the agencies and nonprofits that we think should be responsible are up and running mm -hmm. so that those calls can be transferred to those agencies and along with the money that we have determined, well, this was funding you know, calls for mental health. This was funding all these things that we shouldn't have been doing. So then we can take the money because when you just take the money without the tasks, mm -hmm. that just ticks the police off even more. Mm -hmm. And it's like it, it it's like you know you got you, you have a child right and the child you, mm -hmm. you, you tick off the child you the, the, the child can't kick you but as soon as they yeah. get outside they kick the dog that's right <laughs> right yeah. and so these conversations need to take place so that we can actually change policing because mm -hmm. policing is the most efficient and effective governmental agency we have they do exactly as they were created to do mm -hmm. well i mean there's so many different ways to go and just sort of on the last point you have i know here at all saints um we've talked a lot about when do you call the police and we've really tried to create something where that is the absolute last resort mm -hmm. um, to call the police because we know, and this isn't even so much about the passing of police bar, but it's about policing in America. Mm -hmm. um, we know that particularly uh, if the person is black or brown, uh, that, that is in, in distress or causing distress. Right. Um, and also if the person is, is homeless, right. um, the percentage chance of bad outcomes involving injury and death mm -hmm. just gets really, really high. Mm -hmm. And so we try to do that, you know, and the challenge is, most of the instances, um, what we really need on call is a social worker. What mm -hmm. we really, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we've got, you know, some folks on staff who can do this. What we really need is, is people who can navigate that kind of conflict. We don't need an armed response no. um, to these things. Um, one of the things I'm wondering, because I saw this in St. Louis and I've continued to see it here in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. is over the last 10 years, an increased percentage of police officers who are veterans of active duty in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, who have come back here, and this is particularly as police forces have struggled to recruit, have found, uh, you know, and, and, and actually police, I've had police field police departments say, this is, you know, we look for people um, mm -hmm. who have military experience, you know, and that creates a couple different challenges. First of all, a military approach is command and control. It is mm -hmm. not community based. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking with people with undiagnosed and untreated PTSD and trauma. Um, and then as we militarize our police departments, we're giving them the same weaponry they had uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and turning them loose on the streets. As you've been a chaplain to a police department, have you seen this? Um, and, and how much of your chaplaincy uh, is really working, you know, doing trauma healing, both from things that have happened on the force, but maybe also things that mm -hmm, happened before. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this is nothing new. When mm -hmm. I joined in the 70s, they were actively recruiting from the military. Mm -hmm. So this, it, it, it just went below the surface. But this is nothing new because as you say, you know, the command and control, I don't really want you to think, I want you to react. Right. right? And then you have, you are you are hiring people who have been trained to kill, mm -hmm. right? 
You've been trained yep. to, to, to kill. And so, you know, when, when, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you're not reprogramming, and police academies don't reprogram, mm -mm. police academies are like, any, you know, it's like boot camp. We're going to tear you mm -hmm. down and recreate you in our own image. Mm -hmm. So if you don't reprogram, you are putting folks out on the street who have been taught, who have been seen, and look at my look at my tools. What what do I have? Sometimes I have mace. I mm -hmm. may have a taser, but I've got a gun. Mm -hmm. I've got a gun. And having uh, been in charge, um, second in command of of uh, police academy, this is where traditions come in. Mm -hmm. If you are a new recruit and you are taught by your training officer, mm -hmm. it is better to have 12 people try you than six people to carry you. Your duty is to come home alive mm -hmm. every night. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. That's the mentality. Yeah. And that's one reason why there was a push for for women uh, to to join police department because they thought that women didn't have that 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 macho that that alpha male, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. okay, you know, I can see I'm not going to win, so just let me kind of back off. I don't have to prove who I am. Mm -hmm. If you want to win today, that's fine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'll just wait for you to get over what it is, whatever it is you're, you're getting over. And so we really have to think, who do we want? And during the late 70s, 80s, early 90s, all you heard was community policing. Mm -hmm. Community policing, right. which primarily was a way to just get money out of the federal government without changing mm -hmm. the police department. Okay? And so you heard officers say, I'm not a social worker. Yeah. I'm not a social worker. Yeah. And so if that's the mentality, plus you have the traditions that are being passed on from older officers to younger officers who come on I idealistic, but then they're told, oh, forget all that you learned in the academy. And no, your job is to come home and don't take anything off of anybody. We are creating, setting up situations where folks don't think, how can I handle this a different way? Mm -hmm. And I have this gun. Just the fact that you have a gun and you were taught that the only reason you take that gun out of the holster is to kill. Mm -hmm. Not to warn, mm -hmm. not to maim, but to kill. Mm -hmm. That's the only time you take that gun out of the holster. Yeah. So now I have my gun out of my holster. Yeah. What do I do with it? You shoot it. Okay. Yeah. The police training in terms mm -hmm. of, of of firearms, center of mass. It's not like television. The FBI is always winging somebody, mm -hmm. right? It's center of mass. Yep. And if they don't go down to center of mass, the next shot goes to the head. Yep. And so you you have to be a very very strong person to resist that pull mm. you have to be a very strong person to resist the pull of i'm being disrespected well so what if you're being disrespected mm -hmm. you don't have to win right, what right. you're trying to do is resolve you know so so you see where where minor things you know jaywalking jaywalking mm -hmm. and the person ends up dead how do you get from jaywalking to dead well, that's the story of Michael Brown. Yeah. He was doing his walking in the street. Walking in the streets. Yeah. Walking in the streets. And so, you know, because you're disrespecting me because I tell you to, you know, to, to get on the sidewalk. Right. Well, I was, you know, I, I was in Ferguson and I'm looking, mm -hmm. I'm like, there's nobody driving in these streets. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's nobody, there's no cars, there's mm -hmm. no rush hour. But I also know that in my community, Tacoma Park, 
which is still predominantly white, we walk in the streets all the time. Mm-hmm. And we've got sidewalks. We just like the freedom of the streets. That's right. And so when you have all of this and that people can't deal with the people they stop not doing immediately what they say. Mm. Or I'm going to ask, why are you stopping me? Why are you stopping me? It it creates a tension that ends up, in too many cases, deadly. And then with Black people, um, Kimberly Jones, an activist, says, it says that when your skin color is your weapon, you're always armed and dangerous. Yep. yep. Always armed and dangerous. Mm-hmm. And so I'm on alert because you're Black, that equals dangerous, that equals armed. Mm-hmm. I've got to be on the watch for that. And so we really have to rethink policing. We have to rethink how we train and have conversations with officers. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what, you know, let's let's just go through this scenario and and see what happens. Why did you do that? Well, I was disrespected. Okay. And so we really have to 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 stop and have some deep conversations between uh, the police and the community if we're going to make a substantive change. Because if we don't, policing policing does not change. It doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It has to be changed. Mm -hmm. It has to be changed. And so there has to be a groundswell from the community says, no, this is what we want. And this is how we're going to reorganize. We're going to recreate policing in our community so that people are treated with respect. They're treated fairly and they don't end up dead for stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I, and I'm interested both, were you part of a police union? when you were uh when you were an officer yes yes so because that's another piece that i've known like in st louis and st louis is not alone here the the police union in st louis was so overtly racist that black police officers had to form their own police union um and uh and, and so you know that and that has absolutely been you know been the been the case you know in st louis and and as i understand in some other places too mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and it feels to me that one of the biggest opponents and roadblocks to, and when you say reform, to abolition, to changing the way we police, is police unions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and how do we get around that? Ah, right now, what we have is a tail wagging the dog. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I have police chiefs who have told me, you know, I don't know how to manage the union. I, I, mm-hmm. I'm afraid of the union. I'm like, you are the chief. All of these folks work for you. But again, this comes out, and this is where the history of policing comes, because I joined policing at a time when public employees could not unionize. It was illegal, uh, right? It was illegal. Mm-hmm. But because the relationship between uh, the worker bees and management was so bad, the courts then said, okay, you all can unionize. And so you have an us versus them within the department mm. that then translates out of the department and the unions have become so strong that they wag the tail of the dog Mm -hmm. and somehow police chiefs have got i mean they got a whole lot of organizations for chiefs they Mm -hmm. have to manage this no we you know we will ensure that you have safe working conditions we will ensure that you are paid fairly we will make sure that You know, you're not treated unfairly when it comes to changing towards a duty, but you're not in charge. Mm -hmm. You are not in charge. And because unions, as they get bigger, can then uh, donate to politicians, Mm -hmm. that's where the power comes in. Mm -hmm. That's where the power comes in. Uh, I remember um, NYPD, something had happened and 
the mayor, de Blasio, was mm-hmm. walking, and the officers turned their backs on him. Oh yeah, was that a like a right? graduation ceremony or something? Right. Yeah, they turned their back. If it were me, they'd all be fired. We're gonna mm-hmm. go to court. We will mm-hmm. go to court, and you're gonna have to go to court to get your jobs back. Mm-hmm. We're just gonna do that because you're not you are not going to show that type of disrespect. Mm-hmm. But you can because you know don't want to go to court, or if we go to court and they're fired, and then the court makes them come back. That's fine. You come back, but you're going to be in Siberia. So we got some questions coming in. Uh, reminder, you can text 910, text ASC 910-839-8272. Um, and I also want to talk about the book. Uh, so um, Crystal uh, asks, uh, when you say people join the police department to make a difference, what does that mean? especially because they don't want to be social workers. Help me understand what difference they want to make and can make. Okay. Especially for um, non-white officers mm-hmm. and LGBTQIA officers and mm-hmm. Latino officers, Asian officers, they have witnessed, and a lot of them tell you, they have experienced negative interactions with the police. And so their idea is that we will come on to change the police department. Right. That's not so much white people joining the police force. Right. As wanting to change. That's okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, and so th- they want the police to change. I mean, e- even white officers, you know, well, we, we can do better. Mm-hmm. But again, that that culture is so infectious that if you're not constantly aware of how it can affect you, you can be drawn in. And it, and the other thing is that when your evaluations are based on arrests, mm. right? So we can talk about community policing and resolving issues and, and that arrest, but when your evaluations are based on arrest, even though I might not want to arrest you, I need something tonight when I go into the station. Mm-hmm. But what it takes is having conversations within uh, within the department and really being serious. And it's because it's hard work during the 80s and 90s when community policing was was, you know, all the thing they were attempting to change the evaluation systems. But it just took too much work. We can just rely on arrests or traffic stops as opposed to, well, how do I measure that you talk to a, a, a community member and the issue was resolved and everybody was happy? I mean, how do you quantify that? Mm-hmm. Right. What's the metric? <laughs> What's the metric? Yeah. And so they said, okay, we can't, we can't figure it out. So we're just going back to <laughs> arrest and trap. Well, it's the same thing we as a church do with like average Sunday attendance. We don't know how to actually measure the impact of the gospel in people's lives. Right. So we'll just say, okay, how many people were in church on Sunday? And right. That which may or may not have a correlation to, you know, is anything transformational happening? That's right. That's right. So you have to do. You have to really do do the work to to make the change. Um, but you, you you need a different mentality that the police can actually be a force for good in the community and work Mm -hmm. from there. Yeah. So we have a question about, um, so do police forces have spiritual directions or the chaplains employed? What is the message? So you're, you are a a police chaplain. Um, What does that work look like? (laughs) Number one, we don't proselytize or we don't evangelize. Why? Because there are all kinds of folks on the police department. We're there primarily as, as a listening tool and with uh, the, the department here, I serve on the police chief's advisory committee also. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if they, if they want to talk, they can call. If they don't want to talk, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so it, it's really figuring out how just to be um, uh, a presence, a presence for them. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So I want to jump in and, and talk about the book, uh-huh. um, uh, Preaching Black Lives uh, Matter. Um, and first thing I want to say is explain the title and particularly the parentheses. 
<laughs> okay. So there was this other book called uh -huh. Teaching for Black Lives. Uh -huh. And it was a riff off of Teaching for Black Lives. Okay. And so preaching Black Lives and then in the parentheses matter. <laughs> so that's how that got. And the oh, okay. more I looked at it after it was published, I was like, why did I do that? But anyway. Uh, <laughs> It well, talk about sense. then the idea of the whole book. Tell tell us tell us about if it's good. Oh, thing, okay. Apology. So there there was a, a a conversation on Facebook that Ken and Stephanie Spellers started. Mm -hmm. uh, she she had read Teaching for Black Lives, and and uh -huh. she posted, "Well, we need something like this for the church." And she listed about five of us, and uh -huh. so. You know, me, I said, oh, well, that looks kind of interesting. Let me read Teaching for Black Lives. And I said, well, I could probably do this. And I'm going, well, how do I do this? Because I've never written a book. I don't even know a publisher. Let me just kind of, oh, church publishing. Let me just kind of put something uh -huh. in and see if they would um, accept it. And so when I finally got the message, I said, okay, start writing. You know, you have one of like, okay, now what did I do? What did I do? And I knew what I wanted to write, but I also thought it was an opportunity for those who, like me, would probably never get an opportunity to write, but have something to say. And so the book really looks at, uh, takes a, a look at those who have preached Black Lives Matter or preach racism or any of the isms or phobias, mm -hmm. because there are any number of people uh, in our congregations who will tell you, we've never heard a sermon on race mm -hmm. or you talk to clergy and they said i would love to however i need my job <laughs> you yeah. know yeah. and so they are afraid and so you have a combination of sermons that were preached and so sermons that folks would like to preach mm -hmm. uh and then the second part is advocating we have people in the episcopal church who've been doing this forever mm -hmm. clergy and lay so mm -hmm. how do you make that preaching real because i mean you can preach forever but is it transformative? Does it get right. put into action? Right. And the last section really has to do with teaching. So preaching is teaching. Formation is teaching. We form our people as what? Mm. Do we try to get them in this narrow Anglican box where they leave who they are at, at the door? And so you have folks who have thought about, okay, well, what should be in seminary training it's no different than in our universities you know you have your core curriculum right right and it's kind of white yeah <laughs> right kind, so kind of want, yeah right you have to go to the black track or the woman's track or right. you know the, the asian track and and how do we make these courses that are necessary to complete american history to complete church history as as core courses as opposed to electives mm -hmm. that they can choose or not choose but still come out with a degree still graduate seminary and in in one of the um uh, articles is written by frank thomas who is the founder of of the first the first phd program in african-american teaching and sacred rhetoric at mm. uh, Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis. Now, how many whites would get a PhD in that? Right, right. But we have plenty of people of color who have obtained uh, doctorates in white folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yep. Yep. And people say, oh, that's for black people. <laughs> oh, no, it's for anybody who wants to learn something else other than European subjects, mm -hmm. okay? And so it's an opportunity for, for people to, to get what was on their minds into, into print. Mm -hmm. uh, this might be the first, last, and only thing they ever write, but it, 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 it's there. And to let people know uh, who read it that yeah, you also have an opportunity to do something like this to have your have your voice heard. Okay. Uh, so it was it was an interesting uh, proposal, uh, a project, and I enjoyed pulling it together and uh -huh. also writing for it. Also writing for it. Um, so and, and well, you're so in like, there. You know, yeah, you're I'm, in, I'm there. in there, but that's <laughs> definitely not a highlight. Um, <laughs> One of the things in the teaching section, you wrote a piece called, Can I Be Black and Episcopalian? 
Yeah. Um, so talk about that. Can I be black? And this has to this has to go with you know formation. Mm-hmm. Do I have to leave who I am at the door and become mm-hmm. because Anglican equals whiteness, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Now you have black so, Anglicans, but yep. Anglican equals whiteness. Anglican Episcopalian. There's a specific way of of worshiping, a certain style of liturgy. Mm-hmm. Only you know you bring out the black hymns during Black History Month, mm-hmm. <laughs> as opposed to. How does anyone come into one of our services and see themselves? Yeah. You talk about welcoming, radical welcoming. Anybody, mm-hmm. regardless of their race, regardless of how they uh, gender identify, when they come into our service, they see something of them in the service as opposed to having to leave themselves outside and become something else. I mean, the, the series uh, this week on, on the Black mm-hmm. Church, Mm. And you know, I oh, I never knew this. Oh, I never knew oh, this. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, I learned so. Oh my goodness. You know, <laughs> so so we have we have black parishes in the Episcopal Church that may disappear in ten years. Yeah. Okay, because their members are aging, finances, resources are are dwindling. But the question we have to ask is, why do we have black parishes mm-hmm. in the first place? Mm-hmm. Is that because we decided we didn't want to worship with white folks? It's because we were not welcome, did not feel welcome. Even today, there are I've heard people say, you know, I, yeah, I saw the the Episcopal Church welcomes you and went in, and it was not a good feeling. Mm-hmm. Okay. So to have those conversations and to kind of use this book as a way to to start those conversations. And also to figure out where where do we go? You know, we are a church that talks about, okay, we're going to do something about racism. We want racial reconciliation. But what exactly does that look yeah. like? Yeah. And where do you start? Maybe we need mm-hmm. to start in-house. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and there's, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm. Oh, no, I say so much, like we're, we're discovering that so much of it starts with, well, it's like, you know, if we look at sacramentally what reconciliation of a penitent is, it starts with self-examination. Yes. Before you get to anything else, and that means, you know, as Jennifer Baskerel Burroughs talks about, as Bishop Jennifer talks about, you, you got to tell the whole story before you can write a new story. Yeah. And so you can write a new story. And so, like what you're describing, uh, there's a church uh, not far from here called Saint Barnabas, mm-hmm. um, which is black church in Northwest Pasadena, that has a history directly linked to what you're talking about with All Saints Church. Mm-hmm. Um, of you know, and the, and and we need to lean into that story. We actually need to listen to amazing folks at St. Barnabas. Listen to their experience and what's mm-hmm. what's their version of that story. We have yes. our version of that story. Yes. We need to listen to those stories. We need to listen to the experience of Black people in our congregation. Yeah. Um, and what draw you here, and what has been your experience uh, of being, you know, our, you know, you say, can you be Black and an Episcopalian? It's like, you know. Do we require people uh, when they come to All Saints Church, no matter what we predominantly think of ourselves? uh, You know, we got to reality check some of this stuff. We have a self image that we are radically inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a self image that's based in in aspiration and in truth. Mm -hmm. And we need to listen to what, you know, because we're a dominant white church, we need to listen to the experience of people who don't fit into that dominant culture and, and can we create a space that is safe enough for people to be brave and mm-hmm. speak their truth? And so that's, that's some of the work that, you know, that we have to do. But then I'm also reminded that you know, when you go from self-examination to confession, but then you don't just jump to absolution, there's reparation <laughs> and repentance and there's amendment of life. Yes. And, and that's where we seem to run into some trouble. Well, well, yeah, I, I, I have a friend and she uh, no. attends a Methodist church and she attends the white Methodist church out of which the black Methodist church came. And mm-hmm. so a couple of years ago, they had a service of reconciliation. Mm-hmm. So I said, so you're all worshiping together now. And she said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I said, then you have not reconciled. Oh, no, no we had the service of, re- we admitted, they admitted. I said, yeah. but you're not back together. Right. You have not reconciled. You've gone through the the fluff, yeah. 
but you haven't done the hard work. And, and we, have to, we have to admit, we have to understand that there's no one way to be Black. There's no one way mm-hmm. to be Latino. There's no mm-hmm. one way to be Asian. Mm-hmm. But there is only one way to not be all of that, and that's to assimilate whiteness. Mm-hmm. Where we see that whiteness is, 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 is the best. Everything white is, is good. The white church is better than the black church. The white musical uh, the white music, music right. is better than the black music. Mm-hmm. And so we have to have those types of conversations. And even within our own groups, we have to have mm-hmm. those conversations. Because everybody who's come here or who has been here has tried to assimilate to whiteness. Mm-hmm. Because that was how you succeeded. Mm-hmm. But it hasn't worked. Mm-hmm. It hasn't worked well. So mm-hmm. we need to be who God is calling us to be and, and find faith institutions that said, bring your whole selves. Right. Bring your whole selves. I mean, even if we look at, at the Eucharist, you know, we, we, we go to this table, mm-hmm. you know, because we are broken to be reconciled, we go to the table broken and we leave the table broken. And how do we how do we fix that? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. We have discussed it, like why do we do Eucharist anyway? And you know we'll get on. No, but we say we go to be reconciled, but we leave the table just as broken. Yeah, yeah. You talked the when we were talking uh, a couple of days ago. You used a term that I hadn't heard before. You called it righteousness. Righteousness. <laughs> yes, white. And that was that. That idea is, you know, if the presumption that if it's white, it's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that was even discussed um, uh, January of twenty twenty uh, at at a former a former uh, conference. Mm-hmm. And so okay, that came yeah. from within the Episcopal Church. The pastor, mm-hmm. the, the presenter, used that term. You know, righteousness. That you know, if it's white, it's right. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's um, it, it's interesting, and 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 you've also described that as being a reality in predominantly Black Episcopal churches as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The deference to what the, is white. The deference, you know, why are we playing that music? Uh, because mm-hmm. it's ours, mm-hmm. you know. Or you will hear, um, uh, I I left the Baptist church, so I wouldn't have to hear that kind of music mm-hmm. or that kind of preaching. Well, that yep. that's 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 racial oppression, self racial oppression. So, a um, couple more questions. Clara asks, "How can citizens feel safe in making complaints to the police department?" Whew. <laughs> depends on the police <laughs> department. Uh, yeah. The first thing is, is I always advise people that if your chief has an advisory committee or there's some outreach com- that number one, you need to be on it. Mm-hmm. You need to be on it so that you have a direct dial to who, whomever and that you can become that conduit for folks who don't feel safe to get mm-hmm. that information to the police departments. But we can't change policing sitting on the outside and thinking, oh, it'll change on itself. We have to become part and parcel of that process. We have to be on the inside, however we get on the inside mm. to make it easier and better for those in the community to express how they feel. What do you think of civilian oversight boards and committees? They can be good if the civilians uh, don't become just like the police. Mm. Sometimes sometimes they can be just as infected. They then become super, super pro-police. Mm. Okay, so you either have super, super pro or the police can't do anything right. Mm-hmm. And so you have to find uh, uh, you have to find a middle ground. You have to find consensus for it to work. Uh, you you don't hire or or have volunteers on those committees who who are out for the police. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it it it's like your vestry. You don't want people running for the vestry who say, "Well, I want the church to be like this." Yeah. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not what we're looking for. We want somebody who's going to figure out where the church is called and will help us get there. <laughs> yeah, because we're going through this process here in Pasadena. We're 
uh, they're supposedly putting together a civilian oversight commission. Um, our uh, senior associate for peace and justice, Juliana Serrano, has been working a lot on this. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's going to be really key who we get on that commission. Yeah, it is. Um, it is. And so, uh, you know, we're going to be really watching closely who the candidates for that are uh, and, 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 and how we can lobby for candidates that, again, are going are gonna to mm -hmm. actually get some work done. Mm -hmm. um, someone else asked, what do you see as a way forward in changing policing that can be successfully implemented in every local municipality? And what will it take to achieve this? Okay, it's a small question but go ahead <laughs> jesus uh <laughs> that's right come again first it it, it takes the community mm -hmm. to want to do something yeah and to okay. commit the time this is not overnight mm -hmm. you know this is not a one and done but you have to figure out what type of policing and every time i say this and okay i know there's some communities that like policing the way it is and we'll try to keep it there but we're looking for uh god's justice regardless mm -hmm. of whether or not we actually use those terms because everybody mm -hmm. doesn't go there with us right but you know what would god want for god's people mm. and so if we go in with that mindset without even saying the words then we can make substantive changes. But we have to be willing to listen to folks, to explain what we say, because when I talk about abolition, I have to immediately follow with what I mean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because folks have, oh, no, we can't do that. Uh, and, and, and to really understand that you have to deconstruct policing first before you can reconstruct it. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? I know Camden, New Jersey did something similar in which uh, the chief fired everybody to include himself. And while they were re re reconstituting themselves, they had you know uh, state police to come in and provide services. Wow. But every, everybody was fired to include him. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to reapply. Now, some made it back, others didn't. But when they came back, they understood, no, we have a different set of values here. Wow. And we said, now, if if you don't believe in these values, if we find you violating these values, you're gone. So it that's courageous be, leadership. I mean, that's not you know, it's not perfect, but it yeah. is. It, it's 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 a start. You know, again, you have to stop. You can't. You have to have something new. And the only way to do it is just to kind of, is to throw it out and then bring in what you want. Might be with the same mm -hmm. people, but they have a different idea. They, oh, I can't do that anymore if I want to stay here. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's 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 an amazing story. I need to, I need to, I'd heard some stuff about Camden. I want to learn more about that. Yeah. Um, great question here. How does reconciliation take place between white identifying parishioners and black parishioners when whiteness in and of itself is in opposition to blackness? In other words, reconciling with what kills one culturally, psychologically, and historically, and sometimes even physically? Reconciliation between the races is not possible. Okay. And this is why. Reconciliation assumes that there was a relationship, a positive relationship to mm. begin with. Mm. And that somehow that relationship was broken and people identify how it was broken and then determine how to repair it. The races in this, this country were never one. Mm. They were never together. And so we can't reconcile. We have to begin with conciliation. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out how do we become one? because we were never one. Mm -hmm. And so to have those types of conversations, to, to, to look at the history, the whole history of, of this country, the whole history of, of, of the church. I, you know, I was shocked, you know, you, Episcopal seminaries, we take history of the Episcopal church and you get Absalom Jones, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's about it. Right, right. <laughs> 
we need to go all the way back to the colony of Jamestown because that was the Anglican church that then morphed into the Episcopal church. You see mm-hmm. that, oh no, we, we've, got, we've got some problems here that we need to fix from the very beginning of the Anglican presence in this country. So what is the call for the church in, you know, for such a time as this? To actually, to attempt to be like Jesus mm-hmm. and know that you're going to get blowback. I mean, Jesus could have been that guy who just walked around praying for everybody and he wouldn't mm-hmm. have ended up on the cross, but he challenged. He challenged the status quo and folks said, we got to get rid of him because mm-hmm. he is messing up what we like. We don't care if other people are unfairly treated. We like the status quo. And so it's it's really looking at Jesus's ministry. It's Jesus's ministry that got him up on that cross. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then also looking at our prayers and our creeds. You know, the Nicene Creed has nothing about Jesus's ministry. Mm-hmm. It's a comment. Right. right. Nothing. Mm-hmm. So the focus has been get my life together so I can get to heaven. But young mm-hmm. people are saying, I don't know nothing about that heaven. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. But I know about the hell right here. That's right. And so the, the church needs to deal with the hell right here. What mm-hmm. does God want for God's people? God has provided us everything. How do we make sure that people have what they need to thrive? Which means that we have mm-hmm. to shut down all barriers, destroy all barriers that keep God's people from being who God is calling them to be. Amen. Amen. We're going to have to wrap that up and we're going to, I can't wait to hear you preach now. Uh, (laughs) So, and um, we're definitely, if you will keep coming back, we will keep this conversation going. We'd love to. Um, And just, just deeply, deeply grateful for you uh, and for your friendship. Opportunity. So um, thanks, everybody. We're going to take, you can uh, jump into, we have links to uh, Children's Chapel with Kelly Aaron O'Fallon and also links to our Meditative Chapel. Um, And then we'll be back right here, wherever here is for you at 1115. (laughs) uh, And we'll have uh, our 1115 Eucharist and uh, Reverend Dr. Gail Fisher Stewart will be bringing the word for us. So uh, see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. See you in a few. Uh,